Hi, this is Wayne Odegaard with uh, Aviation Laboratories, and I'd like to talk about oil filter analysis. In an earlier video, we talked about oil analysis. We also talked about the whys of oil and filter analysis and when it's important to use one versus the other. What I'd like to focus on in this video is how we do filter analysis. But the first step in that is actually getting the filter to us. So what does that mean? When you're out changing the oil and the oil filter in your aircraft, when you get the oil filter, drain the excess oil off of it, but you don't have to drain it all. Drain the excess oil off of it and put it in this canister that comes with one of our kits. Put it in the canister, screw the lid on tight. If you want to put a little tape around the lid, that's fine, but it should hold by itself and send it to us. Now, before you seal that box and send it to us, don't forget to fill out the customer information form. The customer information form is really, really important because it contains your contact information, it contains the information about the engine and the oil, the oil filter that you've taken out of your engine, and it contains any information that you might have about maintenance to your engine so that it helps us evaluate the data once we've got it. So you send all of this to us. Once we've got it, we follow a process that's sort of like this. We get a dozens of these a day, not hundreds like oil analysis, but dozens of these for sure. When we get it, the first thing we do is we take the filter out, we evaluate it for any issues that it might have, uh, holes, damage of any kind that might have affected the data reading that we're going to get. If it's a turbine engine, it comes without a housing, so it's easy. If it's a piston engine, we do kind of the same thing that you would do out in the hangar if you were looking at it yourself. We cut it open, we take off the housing, we pull off the pleating, and then we put it back into this canister. Or the turbine filter, we just put it back in this canister. Now the first thing we do is we fill this about this full with virgin solvent, and it's a solvent that used to clean the filter. So we fill it about half full with virgin solvent, and our technicians shake this. And we have an actual protocol for this, but we shake this for about two minutes. It, you can tell they're doing it because you can hear the thump, 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 thump of the filter going back and forth in there. The guys that do this look like Popeye because they get, after doing this for a long time, it's hard, two minutes of this. Once they're done with two minutes, they drain off all of the solvent that was in here. But they do it in a special way. They actually do it in a, in a uh, vacuum funnel with a 0.45 micron filter pad. 0.45 micron filter pad. So they pour all of the solvent that was in here with all of the debris that came out of the filter. They pour it through that filter pad. And oftentimes we need a vacuum to suck that solvent through because the filter is dirty enough that it clogs the filters. So we suck that solvent through and we're left with just debris on the filter pad. But we're not done. We fill this back up with about a half full of solvent. We take the filter, the pleating or the turbine filter, and we use a forceps to clean in between the creases of the, of the uh, filter or the pleating material. What we're trying to do is get as much debris out of the filter or the pleating as we possibly can. All of that is data to us, so we want to have as much of it as we possibly can. So we've taken the first cut of it, the stuff that came off easily, and we've done that, drained that through the filter pad already. Then we clean the pleating, it goes back into here again with virgin solvent, and we do the same thing again. We shake it for two minutes, right? We shake it, shake it, shake it. We're trying to get all the debris off the filter. By the time we're done the second time, the filter or the filter pleating should be very, very clean. Again, we pour that liquid through the filter pad. We use a vacuum to suck the solvent through. Now we're left with just debris on this filter pad. We remove it from the glassware. We put it on an aluminum uh, tray, and we put that in an oven to dry it. And the idea of in an oven is to flash all the solvent off. So we flash the solvent off. It takes a couple hours for us to dry that. But when we're done with all of that, we're left with clean, dry debris that's on this 0.45 micron filter pad. Now we can start to evaluate what we had in your filter. 
Now, you may think, oh, I do that out in the field. But honestly, most people can't see particulate uh, that's smaller than about 40 microns. My old eyes may be a little bit uh, bigger than that. So if you're out in a hangar, imagine you're out in a hangar, you pull the pleating apart, you're trying to look at this debris, but you, it's in oil, it's in dirty pleating. So you might be thinking to yourself, oh, I do that out in the hangar, right? But imagine for a minute being out in the hangar, you cut open this filter if it's a piston engine, you pull the pleating out, you spread it apart, and you're looking at it. Now, most of us can't see particles that are smaller than about 40 microns in size. With my old eyes, maybe 50 microns in size. But it's worse than just that. You're out on the hangar, the lighting's probably poor, you've got particulate that's in an oily mess, the pleating material, right? There's no way you can see particulate down to 20 microns, let alone 0.45 microns, like we catch for you on this filter pad in our lab. So what we're trying to do is clean and look at and evaluate the information that was in that filter in a much, much, much more analytical and precise way than you ever could, no matter how good you are, no matter what you're looking at, no matter what you're doing, you can't possibly do it as good as we can do it in the lab. So we have this stuff. We've got the 0.45 micron filter pad. It's clean, it's dry debris, we're looking at it. Now we can do a couple of simple things. We can take a forceps and kind of spread it around and look to see if we see anything shiny in there. We can take a magnet, remember it's an aluminum dish, we can take a magnet and look for any movement in there. We'll always see a lot of coke and carbon, a lot of dirt and debris in there. We'll look at that too, we'll kind of move it out of the way. We're really looking for the metal bits not the dirt and the carbon, right? We weigh all of that. So now you know exactly by weight how much material came out of this filter. But you'll also know if we see anything that we think is problematic. Now, the way most engine manufacturers like to see this data, the way we present the data is the way that they've asked us to prevent, present this data. So we'll use nomenclature that they want us to use, we'll use descriptive language that they want us to use, and we'll identify problematic chips in a format that they'd like for us to identify them. So if we have this, hopefully we won't see anything that's a problem. So we can report, you have this much debris, it weighed this much, it generally consisted of coke, maybe a small amount of aluminum, maybe a small amount of iron, but generally it's normal. It's what we usually see from a filter with, uh, out of this kind of an engine. But if there's a problem, if you're in the hangar, even if you've done the best job you possibly can in the hangar looking at this pleating material, looking at this filter, if you see something in there, what do you do with it? When it's in the lab, we can look at it under an electron microscope, and that's what we do. If we see a problematic chip, our text can often identify what it might be just by looking at it, just like you might be able to in the hangar. But by taking that chip and putting it on an electron microscope, we can tell what the exact uh, AMS number is of that metal, and using metal maps, we can identify where that metal might have come from in your engine. So now, not only do you have the debris and everything that came out of that filter, all the data, all of the clues to abnormal wear that's in that filter, we have it on a clean, dry piece of paper. But we've also taken the chips, we've put them on an electron microscope, and we've evaluated those chips to determine the exact metallurgy, not elemental analysis, but actual metallurgical analysis of that chip. So we can tell you the exact kind of metal it is and where in that engine it may have come from to give you a much better idea of where the problematic wear might be happening in your engine. So we take all of that information that we've got, all of the SEM data, if we need to use SEM, all the weight, the debris data, all of the classification data that the engine manufacturer wants. We put that in a report format and we send the report to you. We send it to you by email 
but you can also look at it online on our website. You have a customer code. We use engine serial number to keep track of where that debris came from because engines sometimes move from air airframe to airframe, so we use ESN number. Um, and, and, and so you have two ways of evaluating that data. The email that we sent to you with a link, a PDF file for the actual report, and the information that we present to you online through your, our own portal, which is just for you. Uh, if you have questions about that data, if you have any concerns about what that data might mean, if you need to call the engine manufacturer and you're not sure how to approach them, we're always available to talk to you. The reports are written so that you can just read that or send that to the engine manufacturer and it gives them all the information they need. But if you're uncomfortable with that, you're not sure of that, please do call us and we can kind of walk you through that process as well. So kind of get you started on working with your engine service rep so that they can help you identify what the what, what the what the overall problem and the and the proactive steps might be for fixing that problem. Okay, that's the process for filter analysis. If you have any questions or comments about that, please do leave them below in the comments section. If you like this video and would like to learn more about how we do um, uh, aviation fluids analysis, please do subscribe to our to our uh, YouTube channel, and we'll see you next time.